Where'd everybody go? <laughs> Boy, I did, didn't I? <laughs> well, now it's 9 o'clock. Great. Okay, a little unfinished business from yesterday. Um, we need to uh, take a look at uh, our new commissioner's uh, ethics evaluation uh, and also a report on the ethics training of our existing commissioners. Laura. Thank you, Chair. Um, okay, so um, the State Ethics Commission, in accordance with the State Government Ethics Act, reviewed Commissioner Gardner's 2022 uh, Statement of Economic Interest and did not find an actual conflict of interest, but found the potential for a conflict of interest. The potential conflict identified does not prohibit service on this entity. When a potential conflict of interest is identified under NCGS 138A24E, the conflict must be recorded in the minutes of the applicable board and brought to the membership's attention by the board's chair as often as necessary to remind all members of the conflict um, and to assure and to help ensure a compliance with the act. Ms. Gardner fills the role as an at-large member on the commission. She owns Fly Girl Charters LLC and her spouse owns Flat Out Charters LLC. Therefore, she has the potential for a conflict of interest and should exercise appropriate caution in the performance of her public duties should issues involving her entities come before the commission for official action. And that completes my report. Um, in terms of ethics education, everyone is up to date or working on it. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Laura. Okay, moving on to our fishery management plan supplement A to amendment one of the Stripe Muller FMP. Dan Zaff and Jeff Dobbs, would y'all please come up? All right. Uh, good morning. My name is Daniel Zaff. I'm with our fisheries management section based out of the Washington office, and I'm also one of the co-leads for the Stripe Mullet FMP. With me today is Jeff Dobbs, who is based out of our central district office in Moorhead City. We're here to today to discuss temporary management measures to end overfishing of the Stripe Mullet stock. Here's a rundown of the presentation and what we'll cover today. We'll start by discussing results of the benchmark striped mullet stock assessment completed by the division in 2022. Then we'll discuss the need for temporary management measures and some key aspects of striped mullet life history that must be considered when developing management options. We'll characterize the recreational and commercial fisheries for striped mullet. Then we'll move into potential management options and DMF recommendations. The division completed a benchmark stock assessment of the striped mullet stock in 2022. The terminal year of the assessment, which is the last year of data that was used, included was 2019. Results of the peer-reviewed assessment indicate overfishing is occurring in the striped mullet fisheries and the North Carolina striped mullet stock is overfished. On this and the next slide, you'll see horizontal, solid, and dashed black lines. On both slides, the solid lines represent the threshold and the dashed lines represent the target. And I want to point out the 25% threshold was first used in 2006 when the striped mullet stock was assessed for the first time, and it remained unchanged in the 2012, 2018, and in the current stock assessments. The threshold is the reference point that we use to determine if the stock is overfished or if overfishing is occurring, and has been the same for every striped mullet stock assessment conducted by the division. So this figure shows spawning stock biomass calculated by the model, and that's the amount of mature females in the population. 
The threshold is the lowest biomass the stock can maintain and still be sustainable. If biomass is under this line, the stock is overfished. The target is where we want biomass to be to provide the most benefit. The, stock, the spawning stock biomass is below the threshold in 2019, indicating the stock is overfished. There's not enough mature females in the population to maintain the stock. And the stock has been overfished since 2002 and below the target since 1991. This figure shows fishing mortality rate calculated by the model. And again, you'll see this solid line represents the threshold and the dashed line represents the target. The threshold is the highest fishing mortality the stock can handle while still being sustainable. And the target is where we want fishing mortality to be to provide the most benefit to the stock and the fishery. Fishing mortality in 2019 is above the threshold, indicating overfishing is occurring. So the catch rate is too high. The stock has been experiencing overfishing since 2012, and fishing mortality has been above the target since 2000. The striped mullet stock is overfished, and overfishing is occurring in 2019. As statutorily required, management measures will be developed through Amendment 2 to, the, to end overfishing and rebuild the spawning stock biomass. Development of Amendment 2 is underway, with final adoption and implementation tentatively scheduled for 2024. Because of the timeline of FMP development, there will be a four years between the terminal year of the stock assessment and implementation of management measures. A supplement allows for implementation of temporary management measures to supplement Amendment 1 until Amendment 2 is adopted. The DEQ Secretary has determined it is in the interest of the long-term viability of the fishery to develop temporary management measures to supplement the FMP. As such, temporary management measures can be developed to immediately end overfishing of the striped mullet stock. Given the stock is overfished and overfishing is occurring, ending overfishing immediately is in the long-term interest of the fishery because it begins rebuilding the spawning stock biomass and meets the statutory requirement to end overfishing in two years. A 9.3% reduction in total removals is needed to reduce F to, to the fishing mortality threshold which ends overfishing, and a 33% reduction in total removals is needed to reduce F to the fishing mortality target. Temporary management measures developed in the supplement will be implemented via the proclamation authority of the DMF director. There are a few key aspects of striped mullet life history to consider when discussing management. So during the summer, juvenile striped mullet are found in low salinity areas, so in upriver locations and the heads of creeks. While they're in the estuary, they don't really move around a whole lot. And this is supported by tagging studies conducted by the division in the late 90s and early 2000s. And it's also consistent for striped mullet throughout their range. Striped mullet really start to move in the fall when they form large schools before migrating to the ocean where they spawn in lar large aggregations. And these are highly fecund fish, meaning they produce a lot of eggs, upwards of 4 million eggs for a large female. All striped mullet life stages are targeted by fisheries throughout the year, whether it be for bait, food, or roe. But when the fish start to move in the fall is when they are most vulnerable to capture, and that's also when demand is highest. Bigger striped mullet that produce a lot of eggs are targeted in the fall for their roe, which makes up the largest, most valuable portion of the striped mullet fishery. So these figures show annual estimates of recreational striped mullet harvest on the left. And then on the right, um, we show the seasonality of the, of the uh, recreational striped mullet fishery. And I want to emphasize that these are numbers of fish harvested, not weight. So most recreational harvest of striped mullet is for use as bait in other fisheries, so harvest estimates are considered imprecise. As we go along, we do have a question up here from Commissioner Rowe. Yeah, I, I just really don't want to break your concentration. Is this just striped mullet, or does this include white mullet? This is, um, this is just striped mullet. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, so harvest peaked in 2002 and 2003. Um, at greater than 4 million fish, but was stable from 2004 to 2017 and declined in 2018, 2019, and 2020. 
Uh, this decline was likely related to decreased abundance of striped mullet and regulations that drastically constrain or shorten the recreational fishing seasons for southern flounder, uh, which is a fishery where live, live bait or live mullet is a popular bait. Recreational harvest in 2021 increased to around 1.4 million fish. Generally, most rec recreational striped mullet harvest occurs during late summer and early fall with a peak in September, October. So right there. So this figure shows commercial harvest of striped mullet from 1972 to 2021. The dashed lines on this figure represent the minimum and maximum commercial landings triggers that have been used to monitor the fishery since Amendment 1 was adopted in 2015. And we've ex extended them back through time to provide some additional scope when comparing historical landings to current landings. Commercial landings exceeding the maximum line or falling below the minimum line would trigger closer examination of striped mullet data. And this only happened one time in 2016 when landings fell below the minimum line. Uh, and then I want to point out that the open circles on this figure, so there, 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 um, those represent years with significant hurricanes or other major storms. Historically, the striped mullet commercial fishery landed greater than 3 million pounds of striped mullet with landings of greater than 2.5 million pounds occurring as recently as 2002. Since 2003, Landings have generally been around one and a half million pounds, but declined to less than one million pounds in 2016, and were under one and a half million pounds from 2015 to 2020. In 2021, landings increased back over two million pounds. These figures show average commercial landings by month on the left, and percent of commercial landings by month and market grade on the right. And so when we're talking about market grade, red row is the mature female striped mullet, white row is male striped mullet, and mixed are landings that don't specify male or female. Because the commercial fishery primarily targets striped mullet for row, the fishery is seasonal, with the highest demand in landings occurring in October and November. You see here. When large schools form during the spawning migration to the ocean and females are ripe with eggs. Commercial landings during October and November account for over 50% of commercial landings and half of these landings are row mullet, which is represented by these black bars. So see this big peak in October and November here and then these black bars are the red row striped mullet. So this is row landings and those occur, account for over 50% of those peak landings in October and November. These figures show percent of striped mullet harvested by different gears. And so on the left, we have um, different gears on the, on the left here, and then the percent harvested by month and gear on the right. So particularly during the fall, this fishery is very targeted. Striped mullet are primarily targeted commercially using runaround gill nets and in the estuarine waters, in the estuarine ocean waters of North Carolina. And it's important to note that during the fall, this can be a very high volume fishery with thousands of pounds landed in a single trip. These figures show annual inflation adjusted X vessel value of the striped mullet fishery on the left and mean X vessel value by month on the right. So recently, the X vessel value of striped mullet has been around a million dollars annually. And because the fall row fishery is the most valu valuable component of the striped mullet fishery, the value is highest in October and November. When striped mullet become most available to the fishery, the price per pound is highest, landings are the highest, and the percentage of row mullet harvest is highest. When developing management options, the division considers striped mullet life history, the inherent seasonality of the fishery, and how the fishery operates. The proposed management option is an end of year season closure. Implementations of size limits, area closures, uh, and gear restrictions were not considered viable options for implementation through a supplement and are not recommended because they cannot be implemented quickly and efficiently and would be unlikely they could achieve harvest reductions without other measures being in place. A harvest quota 
would result in the harvest reductions, but is not recommended because additional time and resources would be needed to develop a quota monitoring framework and additional infrastructure. Time limits or trip limits could limit harvest, but may result in excessive discards due to the high volume nature of the striped mullet fishery and would be most effective in conjunction with other measures and are not rep recommended for a supplement. Season closures are considered the most effective and efficient method to achieve necessary harvest reductions that can be immediately implemented through a supplement. Early season closures are not recommended because they will likely serve to only delay harvest as landings could be recouped later in the year when most striped mullet landings occur. Closing a portion of the fall season to possession of striped mullet reduces landings in the targeted striped mullet fishery where most of the effort occurs. Targeting a season closure to the period of peak striped mullet harvest minimizes the length of the closure, minimizes impacts to other fisheries, and provides the greatest chance of success. A 9.3% reduction in total removals is needed to reduce fishing mortality to the threshold, and a 33% reduction is needed to reach the target. Because of imprecision in recreational harvest estimates, we can only quantify reductions for the commercial fishery. Therefore, a 9.3% overall reduction equates to a 9.9% reduction, and a 33% reduction equates to a 35.4% reduction when applied only to commercial landings. But any season closure would apply to both the recreational and commercial fisheries. The goal of this supplement is to reduce fishing mortality and end overfishing with simple quantifiable measures as quickly as possible. Peak striped mullet row landings occur in October, November, and more specifically, most landings occur from approximately October 15th through November 15th. An end of year season closure during this time provides the greatest reduction over the shortest period. The closure occurring at the end of the year prevents recoupment of catch increasing the probability of reducing harvest and reducing F below the threshold. The division developed options for season closures to reduce commercial harvest from 10.9 to 33.7%. Option one, ends overfishing to the F target. Option two, drops F below the threshold, which ends overfishing and it approaches the target. Option three, reduces F to the threshold ending overfishing. The DMF recommends a 20 to 33% reduction to exceed the threshold and either meet or approach the target. This reduction level increases the probability of at a minimum ending overfishing, even if there is variability in fishing effort, market demand, striped mullet availability to the fishery or recruitment. To achieve this reduction, the DMF recommends option one, a season closure from October 29th through December 31st, or option two, a season closure from November 7th through December 31st. To achieve a 20 to 33% reduction, any end of year season closure must begin no sooner than October 29th and end no later than November 7th and continue through the end uh, through December 31st. So the MFC actions regarding the supplement are in accordance with the Marine Fisheries Commission FMP guidelines. The MFC will review the draft supplement and reject, approve, or modify the supplement for public comment. If the supplement is rejected, the process ends. Otherwise, the MFC selects a preferred management strategy. The supplement will then be taken for a 30-day public comment period and brought back to the commission in February 2023 for final adoption. If supplement A to the striped mullet FMP is approved, the season closure will be implemented in 2023 via proclamation authority of the DMF director and will remain in place until adoption of amendment two. The DMF will continue development of amendment two to the striped mullet FMP to fully explore all management options and address long-term sustainability and management of the striped mullet stock. Amendment two is tentatively scheduled for adoption in 2024. And with that, um, we'll take any questions that you might have. Questions, Commissioner Roller. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Can you go back to the commercial seasonality slide? Okay, so when we're looking at percent of commercial landings by month and market grade, how would you categorize the mix from January through September and in the fall? Is that bait fishery or is that just neglecting to put it on the trip ticket? Uh, so it's a it's a mix of it's a mix of bait and food fishery. Okay. And I think that a lot of that has to like it depends on what part of the state um, people are fishing in. From what we gathered during the scoping period, um, the fishery in the more northern part of the state, uh, and especially like the Outer Banks, um, that appears to be more of a bait fishery, whereas down south uh, it tends to be more of a meat or food fishery. Okay, but granted, the fall is primarily a road fishery, right? Um, that goes into my next question. Um, could you go back at the closing options when it shows the reduction percentage, please? Okay, thank you. Um, so we have estimated commercial harvest reduction percentage. What's the recreational percentage? What does it get us? So if we, so if we, um, did a recreational closure during this same period. Um, the well, isn't that what's recommended though? Is closing it to everybody? Correct. Yes, that okay. is correct. Okay. So what would the what what is what do we get with, for the recreational addition? So we actually we can't calculate because it's that small, right? It's it's small, but also it's very imprecise. So understood. Yeah. So I just wanted to point out it's because of the way the MRIP surveys are done. It's it, it's by wave, and so mm -hmm. we can't break it down to a day of the year. We can only break it down by wave, the, okay. the harvest estimates. So it's by two-month interval. You can't really get to that fine scale. Well, I mean, you got to have some idea, right? Like, we obviously see, based off of our catch estimates, that recreational harvest and usage is pretty small in November, December, correct? I mean, your own data shows that. I mean, we must have some idea. Yeah, I mean, if you look at page six and seven mm -hmm. of the actual supplement document, we have a table and a figure that shows um, the, the numbers of striped mullet harvested uh, annually, and mm -hmm. um, and that actually includes by wave in there. So. Okay. Oh, I mean, it's just helpful to hear it on the record. That's why I was asking. Right. So for people listening. So. So you want us to. Yeah, I mean, what we, I mean, if you, if you should not just fish, but poundage, I mean, I was hoping we would have some sort of additional percentage reduction, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, at least an idea. Yeah, so in 2021, uh, the November, December harvest of striped mullet by the recreational fishery, there was no estimate. Because so it was very, very, very small. It was very, very small um, and also imprecise because a lot of the fish that are being used by the recreational fishery are being used as bait. Mm -hmm. So And a lot of white mullet. There's a lot of white mullet in there, too. And so I think we discussed at the last commission meeting um, a little bit about how we calculated the uh, – the striped mullet proportion in this harvest, and it was based on a cast nut study that we did. Um, so about 29% of just general mullet are considered to be striped mullet. Yeah, I've asked you a lot of questions about that. Thank you for bringing that up. So question for the director, why did you choose to also close recreational harvest during this, being that it's so small and basically almost immeasurable during November, December? So I, I think and we can staff can speak to what the discussions were around that, but we we feel like it is a, a more equitable way to do it and cleaner as well. I mean, if we have a recreational season uh, open, uh, and I think enforcement is going to be more complicated um, to the mix uh, of that, um, and so we just figured an across the board closure would be uh, the equitable way to do it. I I have. A lot of issues with how we use the word equitable in fisheries management in North Carolina, as you well know. Um, I'm curious, maybe the colonel could speak to this, how we are going to handle enforcement and why allowing recreational possession of mullet may be difficult for November, and what you would allow or how your officers would approach it. It's going to be the same way as we deal with river herring or something like that that's closed, you'll have to have some type of documentation that it was bought legally. So where where would I buy it from? Where could, what would you allow? You would have to come from South Carolina or something like that with a receipt showing that 
it's been purchased legally to be able to prove to us that's where it's coming. How would you prove that that fish was and wouldn't be caught in October, North Carolina, shipped to Virginia, and then sold in Virginia back to us? I wouldn't, but you got to have some documentation if the season's closed for us to be able to actively look at that. Okay, so I could buy mullet to use as bait from outside of North Carolina. And use as bait in the state of North Carolina, yes, sir. Okay, that's interesting. That's the same thing as goes on with the river heron right now. Oh, I understand. Yeah. With documentation. With, docu with documentation. With documentation. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Commissioner Cross. I have several questions. Um, has commercial harvest at all been used in conjunction to estimate abundance? Uh, so... If I'm understanding your question correctly, uh, no. What we do to estimate abundance is we have an independent gillnet survey that looks, at, um, that looks at abundance. The commercial harvest, as you well know, is controlled by a number of different factors, availability of fish, market, whatever it might be. So um, we're not looking at like a specific catch per effort with the commercial harvest. We're just looking at the raw commercial landings that are reported on trip tickets. So you're using the landings on trip tickets as part of the abundance survey? Is that what you're saying? No, it's only used to inform removals for the model. Um, the abundance is derived from our independent surveys. Well, when you've got commercial landings on certain years increasing, and your, do your survey numbers perhaps aren't increasing? Do y'all at all consider any kind of, you know, variance or anything between that? Because, I mean, your, your numbers look, look a lot different than a lot of commercial landings. Uh, so that's something we looked at, and I have a slide for it here. So, so on the figure at the left here, um, that's commercial landings from 2008 to 2021. The figure on the right is our abundance of striped mullet from our fishery independent gillnet survey. They actually track really, really well between the two. This period here from about 2008 to 2014, um, we didn't really see a whole lot of trend there in commercial landings. They were pretty stable with some annual variation. We see about the same thing with our independent gillnet survey. Um, a little bit of an increase from 2008 to 2010, but then they kind of level off. Interestingly, in 2015, commercial landings dropped off. We see the same thing with our fishery independent gillnet survey. 2015, uh, we saw a decline in abundance. See the same thing in 2016, where landings continued to remain low. We saw the same thing in our fishery independent gillnet survey. Same thing for 2017. 2018, which I think you mentioned yesterday, was it was Hurricane Florence, right? So commercial commercial landings remained low. Um, we were still able to sample in 2018. We actually saw increases in abundance for for striped mullet in our survey data. 2019, again, commercial landings remained low. We saw um, low landings in our or low abundance in our survey as well. 2020. Um, I think you also mentioned yesterday that that was a COVID year that really affected the market. Um, we didn't have a survey that year because of COVID, um, so it's hard to make any comparison. But 2021, lending shot up. We see the same thing in our survey. So even though we're not using the commercial landings to calculate abundance, um, because there's other factors that uh, influence the amount of landings that occur, market, whatever it might be, um, we, use, we just use our, our, um, our survey to calculate abundance, but between the two, they actually track pretty well. Well, you've, you, you've led me down a path now that I, that's what I was going to try to discuss with the landings in 20 coming from uh, the issues we had and then landings, you know, commercial landings in 21, but you're seeing increases over the last two years and now this year, they're seeing more mullet than they've seen in probably 10, 12 years. I mean, I've already got, I've got one house, just one house that's landed a half million pounds so far. Just one house. And I mean, that doesn't include all the, that doesn't include up towards Juan Cheese or anywhere else down around the banks or anything like that. So 
you know, from 19 to 20 to 21, and now we're still seeing increases in this in the landings, and you're seeing increases in your in your surveys. So I'm sitting here saying, well, we're seeing these increases, and I know you're basing your data off the 2019 stock assessment. Am I correct? It is 19, isn't it? 2019, yeah. So we're looking at increases the last three years, yet we're looking at putting in a supplement off of that 2019 stock assessment when we know the next three years are already increasing. So I'm having a hard time biting off that we've got to throw a huge percentage reduction at the fishermen, and we know already the last three years we're seeing the increase, and we're going to see it again this year. So I'm not saying that some measure isn't necessary. I'm saying that we, we're sitting here now talking about the data, and the data's not being used in the equation that we already know we have in hand for these next three years. So what I'm looking at is, and what I'm going to eventually suggest is that we, I'm not, I don't want to shove the supplement out the door, but I'd love to see this year's captured data after they get through with this seed this fall season and the last two or three years try to be figured in with the division to try to get to a point to where we can revisit this maybe in May and look at those numbers. And if, and if those numbers aren't, aren't changed or skewed at all by those landings, then maybe we have to make a, you know, the choice before we start back down the road next fall. But we're seeing the numbers increase. I mean, y'all are sitting there saying that. So I do want to say with an increase in our abundance, but also an increase in the commercial harvest, the commercial harvest could negate the I increase. I understand that. So without rerunning the stock assessment, we can't accurately tell you whether or not fishing mortality is lowered and SSB is up. All we know is that there's more fish available to catch, and they're being caught at a higher rate. So that higher catch rate might negate the increase. I understand what you're so, saying, but so I mean... We, we can't accurately assess it until we were to rerun the stock assessment. We still need a couple more years of data after the 2020 gap. Well, that, that, I mean, and I understand what you're saying, but this, this is the problem we run into a lot of these, that we're dragging the, the data's back here, and we're three or four years ahead of it, and everybody's seeing abundance increase in certain species and I mean and, and it, it doesn't add up to the to the general layman's eye so you know that's kind of where I'm headed with this I, I don't I don't want to see her not do something if it's necessary before we get to that period next fall but I would love to see us try to incorporate a few more numbers off of current numbers coming into it up to now up to this fall's capture before we basically dive off the cliff into this and we definitely understand the frustrations with the time lag. Um, but unfortunately, I don't know that there's a way to incorporate the data without running the stock assessment again, which would be a, a time-consuming process, and we just don't have enough years of data after the break in 2020 to, to rerun that in time. Commissioner Roller. Thank you, Chair. Um. You know, sometimes it's really helpful to hear things very plainly. And, you know, like we talked about yesterday, our role here is to manage the fish that are left at the end of the day. At the FinFish Advisory Committee, you guys made a really good point. We're statutorily obligated to follow the assessment, correct? Yeah. And I feel like some of Commissioner Cross's comments, like to quote Yogi Deja Vu all over again, Sounds like flounder. Hey, let's just get more data, more data, more data. And the next thing you know, we're in a whole heap of crap, right? Because the reductions are even greater. So that's why I support the idea of a supplement. I have some issues with it. Because quite frankly, we need to rebuild this fishery before it gets too hard. Um, and another point I want to bring up and see if you guys have anything to add. From everything I've seen across all these fisheries that use runaround nets, effort is way up, correct? Like, way up, right? I mean... Uh, I'm not positive about the numbers, but I, I think, like, on the water observations would say that there, there does seem to be a lot of effort going on right now. Yeah, there, I mean, it's, I think I've seen an effort, like, you know, runaround trips are way up, right? Speckled trout runaround trips are way up. And I do want to Red point Red drum catches are way up. That, uh, from, from our data 
the market was depressed in 2020 mm -hmm. due to COVID, and also there was a hurricane year in for Dorian mm -hmm. and for um, Florence. So that that really affects it, the effort. But um, yeah, I, we can definitely say there was higher effort in 21 than 20 for sure. But historically speaking, everything I've seen is run around Gilnet effort is very high. And that is also a factor of a shift in in gear type from earlier in the fishery in the late 70s to now it was primarily beach seine and it has moved to run around gillnet. So we're seeing a shift which is kind of artificially inflating the amount of run around gillnets uh, compared to other uh, gears within the fishery. Okay. Other questions? Commissioner Krauss. Yeah, can you come out of that? Can you come out of that graph earlier where you had the percentage of effort per month on the on, on the commercial or? side? On the commercial side. This one. Yeah, in the January through uh, September months, what percentage of effort is that? Do you know? Uh, so. You mean just for striped mullet or like yeah. overall? No striped mullet. Uh, so this is just looking at the landings by month. And so January through uh, like September, you see, you can you can see on this figure that um, it's about like overall, it's about 50%. But really, each of those months from January through um, uh, July, like that's less than 5% of the land. Like it's accounting for that's 5% there. That's all under 5% there. But and then August the, and September. The cumulative total in those months, what is it roughly? It's, it's about 50%. And But yet you say an early season closure isn't going to be effective. So, so that's when we're taking into account the biology of the species um, and the nature of the fishery. Uh, I think when we were having internal discussions about this, uh, somebody made a really good point where if we ignore all those other, like the biology and the fishery, it just becomes like a math problem. Like how can we um, add months onto here to get a certain number, um, even though it might not be effective in what we're trying to accomplish here. If you do an early season closure, like you could do a gen, like a January through uh, July closure, for instance. Um, that would maybe that would probably get you like some level of reduction, but all of the the primary focus of the fishery is those later months, October, November, and even into December. So really, if you're just closing the fishery in those early months, and you still have that high demand and that um, more accessibility in October, November, December, those fish can easily be caught later in the year because they're still in the estuary, and while they're in the estuary and undergoing their spawning migration is when they're most vulnerable, and, and when, that's when the demand is highest as well. So um, you might not actually, you really would just be delaying the harvest to those later months. I understand, but when you start talking overall harvest in the later months and the economics of it, it goes a long ways different than it does so far as some of that. Of course, a lot of that product in the earlier months for bait gets, you know, a good price too. But, you know, if there was a way to pre-close up to a certain point, I think you, your economic uh, data would be a lot more favorable for the fishermen. I do just want to note that during our scoping period, we heard from fishermen that it was important to have this fishery all parts of the year. Um, so it seems like it'd be better to have a shorter period of a closure because especially in the northern areas, that bait harvest is so important and that would re that would uh, remove the bulk of their income from mullet. So a longer season would probably have a harder financial impact on the state as a whole. Commissioner Ryder. I've already admitted that my ignorance about this fishery so a question or two based on that ignorance um, well actually first do you have um, experience with the ways that closures of this type particularly late in the season would 
result in effort transfer into adjacent? In other words, out of that 33% or so that you expect, what would you guess you actually would get in terms of reduced effort or landings based on the potential for transferring that effort earlier into the, it's only if you've got, well, one way to look at it is that you're, if there's four weeks of core season and you're taking two of them away, then that's almost a 50% effort reduction during that key window. But, but that's counteracted by the fact that presumably if it's getting ready to close, people will go out more and you'll get more concentrated landings. I just wonder what the division's experience has been in projected versus actual reductions in take using end of season closures. Yeah, I think it's difficult to project. I'm not familiar with any recent examples of when we've done that type of work. I will say with Stripe Mullet, um, the, the peak there, the peak stride mullet landings that you see in October and November, that's, specific, that's really specifically the row fishery. And so those fish need to be rowed up for that. To, and that's because there's high demand for those row fish. So they need to be rowed up for um, that effort to justify. Yes, but the question was whether you would then get twice as many road targeting trips in the first two weeks of that four-week period. Uh, you see what I mean? I, I, I think I got you. Yeah. I don't know, but it, how much um, gear is there in the fishery and how much potential is? I'm just asking. I don't know. The The issue with that is that the fishermen will ride around and look at, wait for the schools to basically school up. It's not like you can add, just add more gear to create more fish. You're, you're actually out there hunting this particular product. And, you know, you may or may not have the fish schooled up and, so therefore, the more gear aspect of it isn't as relevant as it would be in some other fisheries. There's a lot of follow-ups there that I think probably should be delayed to later. But one of them is about the timing of schooling up and water temperature and other things and how warming waters might actually be pushing that later into the season. And so you could end up with a, a higher, in fact, reduction as a result of that. But. But the second question has to do with the timing of the 915 survey for 2022. And so if the fishermen are reporting very large amounts of, uh, of fish there now and that landings are projecting are going to be astronomical, then what do we know about what the 915 survey has been saying about 2022, just so, as an indicator? Uh, so... Uh, anecdotally, uh, at least in some areas of the state, um, I think the, the, our 915 abundance index will be um, on par, at least with what we saw last year, um, which would be reflective of what is occurring in the industry. And one follow-up to that, does that adequately cover the, um, the western lower salinity parts of the sound that we understand are much higher salinity in, in this year? And the mm -hmm. general penetration farther west of more saline dependent animals? Yep. So uh, we didn't include a map of the study area, but I think it's, it'd be the same one that you saw yesterday in Spotted Sea Trout, where we sample um, Noose River, Pamlico River, Pungo River, um, pretty far upstream, like all the way up to New Bern and Washington. And then the western side of Pamlico Sound and the eastern side of Pamlico Sound. And then we also include the New River in our... Um, calculation of abundance indices. And so the last follow-up is, well, it's to repeat, really. So when would the 2022 results be available normally, and when might they be available if we needed just the striped mullet data faster? So uh, typically, we would expect to have our data finalized by April of 2023. Um, and given the data load that we've had to deal with this um, this year and the, the staffing issues that we've had in terms of uh, co uh, coding that data and getting it QA, QC'd, um, that would probably be the most realistic time frame for having it done. Okay. I want to note that the data that we use for the striped mullet is August to December. So until December 15th, that's the end of the study year. We don't even have all the all of the data collected yet for 2022. 
Commissioner Roller, do you have a question, comment? Um, yeah, couple, first of all, quick comment goes earlier to Commissioner Rader's comments regarding displaced effort. Um, I think with these fisheries, it's very clear that we're getting some displaced effort from the loss of our flounder fishery and whatnot. And granted, I'm just speculating, but we're seeing a lot of effort in the Spanish mackerel fishery, for example, possible prices up in that fishery. And, you know, you know, I'm sitting here looking at the big book, which is 2, 142. Thank you, staff. But I wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, the number of trips in 2021 was 9,364. It's the highest number we've ever had in a runaround gillnet fishery in the state. And despite the uh, depression from COVID and the lack of row markets that year, we had 6,600 trips, right? That's the second highest year of all time. Historically speaking, just flipping through here, it looks like this fishery is typically two to yeah, about 3,000 trips. So we're at what, up over 200%, 100 to 200% the last few years. So, so something's going on here, right? So we have a lot of effort. We can't regulate participation in this. You know, We're not allowed to regulate participation. But when you have an open access fishery that's easy and cheap to get into like this one is, um, I think you know we have to keep that in mind. OK. Just a real quick follow-up to that. These are the total number of participants for runaround fishery, not just relative to the mullet fishery, just total runaround, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, let's be, let's be frank, though. Runaround is a lot of different fisheries, but it's primarily mullet. So I, 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 get, I, I wouldn't disagree with that, but I would also say that with all the regulations that we have had um, with flounder, uh, I'm... I'm sure that other uh, fisheries, other folks have gone to using runaround that traditionally used anchor nets, that they, large mesh nets that they can't use anymore, and they may have gone to some other runaround fisheries and created runaround fisheries, really, probably, and you, you made that point earlier. But I just wanted to make sure we, we clarify oh, that. Oh, absolutely, and I, and I made no allusion to being inaccurate on that statement. I just, I think we categorize runaround primarily as mullet fishery, correct? I mean, like, you know, it's, it's important to point, like, it's been really interesting to me to see the makeup of our red drum commercial catch, which was almost primarily a flounder gillnet, fixed gillnet fishery. Now it's the same amount of fish all of a sudden being caught in strike nets, so... Yeah, and I think we can, we do have or should have the information directly relative to mullet, relative to runaround trips uh, and, and um, gears and, and whatnot, that breakdown, we should have that. That would be helpful. Yep. Okay. Commissioner Cross. A question for the director, and then I've got a follow up. Um, with this data, 219, reading what it is and whatnot, and then the, the, the years after it, 2021, 22, we see what's going on now. Um, with the increase in the, well, I mean, what what kind of faith do you actually have in this 2019 assessment on the mullet? Because, I mean, it just, the numbers look squirrely, and, I mean, it looks like we're increasing since, and, I mean, what kind of actual faith do y'all have in that assessment? So, in, in talking with staff, I think we, we're pretty confident in the assessment and the results. We recognize that we, um, ha we made some changes uh, to the assessment, and, um, we recognize that we are seeing uh, increased landings, um, but we don't necessarily know what that might translate into relative to assessment results. I mean, just because we're seeing increased landings doesn't necessarily mean that that will um, prove to, to an uptick in stock abundance when we redo the stock assessment. So I think, you know, our concerns that the staff has outlined and the reason that we we are recommending this supp this supplement, um, and but we do recognize that the need, and we we agree with that, the need to update this assessment uh, as soon as we can with the new data that we can. But we we are confident and we are concerned about this this fishery, and I think that just in general, from a very broad level, this is predominantly, it's been pointed out, a row mullet fishery, and that's concerning. I mean, that's just a concerning point. Uh, anyway, and I think it's something that we we need to to take very seriously that what we're seeing in these landings and even in the commercial landings over the years have although they're going up now and we have seen up and downs throughout the years we are seeing a a decline and even a lot of the fishermen that I've talked to have said that as well they they do think that something is going on with mullet they're not sh quite sure what and it could be environmental and maybe it is nothing to do with fishing we don't I mean, we don't, we understand environmental impacts and that they can be significant, but we do think there is a reason to be concerned about this fishery and why we, we recommended this supplement. Well, um, I, I'm not going to disagree with 
staff, I mean, I, I, if you if you think there's a reason, I mean, if you've got the data and all that, but I just I don't sense the confidence level overall in this data compared to what we're seeing now. And I'm not one to kick the can down the road like they did in the flounder supplement. As but I'm going to make a motion that we delay the implementation of this supplement until we can include some of the data you're going to get this fall off of your 2022 data and that we reevaluate this supplement in May at our May meeting because that's still prior to any action time that you're talking about putting this supplement into place and just see if we do have any other numbers that can help get a clearer picture on this and go from there. Because, I mean, if it comes back and we got the same kind of look, then, then you know, the, op, the we're just going to do what we got to do. But, I mean, if we can delay it until May to revisit it again, with perhaps any additional numbers we can, I still think we've got action time available before next fall. Okay. Let me clean this up a little bit for you. Um, we don't have a supplement to implement at this point, but we do have consideration on the supplement. And I think that's what you're really asking for, correct? Right. What I'm asking for is, let, yeah, I don't, I don't really think we should vote on the supplement until we get more information in May. In May. At our May meeting, and that still gives us a timeline we can operate with. Okay. So I just want to to add one thing, and staff can correct me if I'm wrong, but in order for us to reevaluate what we would recommend or what we would need to project as far as reductions for the supplement, we would have to update the stock assessment. We can do that, but not by May. And so then it kind of leads you down the road of we and our druthers are to continue to work on the amendment uh, side by side while we're doing this. And that was one of the discussions that we had internally. We did not want to uh, hold up the working on the amendment um, for the supplement. So we would continue to work on the amendment. And if we wait on this supplement, this supplement was technically really most likely going to affect only one fishing year. And so if we wait on this, um, it may be that we just would not need to revisit a supplement, but we would be far along enough in the amendment that where we could uh, implement actions relative to that or whatnot. If, if I have um, mischaracterized that, uh, Y'all let me know, but I, I think that's my understanding of where we are as far as the timeline goes. Okay, we have a, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second to this motion? And the motion is saying delay consideration of, of the supplement A. I'll second the motion. Okay, a second by Commissioner Blanton. Okay, further discussion. Director. So I just want to make a statement. Are y'all paying attention to me? <laughs> I'm going to make a statement. Tell me if I'm wrong. But in May, we're not going to have anything to bring back in May. So I just want to make sure that that is completely clear. The, okay. the only Commission. thing that we would know is the in, if there was increased harvest, um, we wouldn't be able to incorporate any of our abundance information into it without a stock assessment. So all we would know is that the <laughs> harvest is increased, and then that would project that we would need more incre uh, further increase in reductions to meet the overfishing status. Commissioner Roller, then Commissioner Rader. Thank you, Chairman. It's kind of a parliamentary question, I guess. I mean, I see Kathy shaking her head. I mean, don't, don't lay in. So I'm looking at this, and I'm going to vote against this, um, period. So what are our options here? Um, do, you, do we need to just approve the supplement as it's written? Do we need to pick our preferred option? Can we offer changes to that? I mean, what can we do here as a commission? I uh, answer that. Okay. Since this is staff recommendations to reduce, to end overfishing, it would take a super majority to go against their recommendations. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, a, a vote to delay 
consideration. It just takes a plain majority. But if we, I think staff recommends us doing choice one or choice two. And um, so we have a little flexibility with that. But they, they are recommended pick one, pick two. Okay. And to go different from what staff is recommending to end overfishing, it would take a supermajority. Which is six votes. Right. Correct. Just, Correct. For, just to be clear. Yes. Six okay. votes. Hmm. Mr. Chairman, can I get one? Can I? Yes, ma'am. Can I ask, uh, does that include a rejection of the supplement? It would take a supermajority as well? Yes. It would. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Commissioner Rader first. Back yeah, I was going to say because this is a a row targeted fishery, it seems to me that the um, the pre spawning run next so October November is in fact a key decision for us, and that we should not imperil action for that fall. And if if even delaying till May would have the effect of doing that with relatively little additional information, I would am going to vote in favor of going forward now. But with the idea of obtaining whatever input we can about these measures during the 30-day comment period that then results so that when it comes back, if we're wrong, and there's compelling evidence that we're wrong, that it'll be on the table there. But I don't think we should delay and imperil action for next fall's row season for that reason. Uh, the question I was going to ask that I didn't get back to before, if you don't mind me putting it on the table, had to do with the size and age structure of the uh, of the landings and what you know about whether or not there's truncated size and age structure and if, if there are trends in those questions or not. For the obvious reason related to more fecund females, uh, presumably during that, that part of the season. So the fishery is primarily uh, driven by younger age classes and more specifically age two. Um, that's specific, that's more that's makes up the the majority of what the landings are, and that makes up the majority of what we see in our surveys as well. Um, I think in previous years and previous assessments, what we've seen is age two to three is what what was mostly being landed, and what we see nowadays we see ages one and two. So there has been some shift. In, in what's being landed by the fishery and what we're seeing in our surveys, but it's primarily driven uh, by one age class. And so it, it begs the question to me as to whether there's any uh, differentiation within the season about the age ages and whether there's any, given the numbers that we've seen about the prevalence of eggs and the bigger older females, whether there's any other strategy that might help isolate effort away from those bigger older females. I mean, they're fecund as all get out, and if we could get one one or two age classes, you know, through that that row run, it just seems like it could rebound fairly quickly. Yeah, so um, I will just add, like, every projection that we've done shows that the stock can recover, like, will recover very quickly if we do management actions. In terms of looking at um, shifting effort away from specific year classes or specific sizes of fish, uh, we completely agree that that's something we should do. Um, that doesn't really fit within the scope or like of a supplement, which we're trying to do more simplified measures. But those are definitely like things that, that we plan to explore as part of development of Amendment 2. Great. Well, I would advocate that we put special attention to that, but also that we go forward <coughs> <clears throat> taking action in a timely way to try to, and I'll just say protect uh, the the spawning run next fall as an investment in that, that rebuilding. Okay, we have a motion on the floor that has been seconded. So not any more discussion. We will vote on this motion. Laura? Commissioner Cross? Aye. Commissioner Blanton? Aye. Commissioner Gardner? Commissioner Huggins? Nay. Commissioner McNeil? Nay. Commissioner Rader? Nay. Commissioner Roller? No. Commissioner Shellam? Aye. Cha Chairman Bizzle? Nay. Motion is defeated six to three. Okay. Now let's go back to the supplement and the need 
to act on the request by staff to do supplement. Can you put, put, um, pull up the one, two, and three recommendations, knowing that staff, I believe, was recommending one and two, either one or, either or two? Commissioner Rollo. Oh, okay. I'm getting in line. Okay, all right. Okay, and director, correct. Y'all, uh, staff is recommending either one or two. Chair will entertain a motion along those lines. Commissioner Roller. I recommend that we approve the supplement choosing option one with the caveat that we allow for recreational possession. And I understand that will take a supermajority if I get a second, but I feel I would be admiss not to offer that as a motion. Wait, say, say that last little bit again. We approve the supplement, choosing option one, okay. but allowing for recreational possession during the whole year. No recreational rec that's, that, that will take a super I, I understand that, and I will offer my, if I get a second, I will offer my rationale. Okay. All right. There is a motion on the floor to um, recommend option one while allowing recreational harvest of striped mullet. Okay, there is a motion. Is there a second? Okay, yeah, all right. Is there a second? Okay, there is no second. Motion dies. Okay. Okay. Wait. Commissioner Bland had can, his hand you, up first. Can you yes. um, pull up the slide that you had that sort of pointed the timeline out of, like, if we reject, everything ends, and then what happens next? If we accept and, and all of the, the slide that you had at the end, it's coming. Yeah. Have you got up there what you wanted? Okay. Just wanted that in front of us. Okay. All right, Commissioner Cross. Can you go back to the options, please? I make a motion we approve the supplement going with option two suggested by the division. Okay, is there a second to this motion? Second. Second, Commissioner Huggins. Discussion? Yes, Commissioner uh, Blank. Question. Commissioner Huggins. Um, moving forward, as we build Amendment 1, um, would this option roll over into Amendment 1? permanently, or are, are we going to explore Amendment 1 uh, with the suite of options, um, and, and this would, you know, sort of go away, um, maybe not completely as a time, you know, as a time closure, but the dates would not be hard and set fast in stone from this point forward, right? Yeah, exactly. So, um, season closures will obviously be discussed as an option when we develop Amendment 2, um, but upon adoption of Amendment 2, if this isn't included in it, this goes away. Trying to multitask. Commissioner Rader. So the target reduction is 30 percent, is that right? And yes, and so it's 33 and 20, so yeah. So I guess what I'm concerned about is that, in fact, we'll end up doing this and nonetheless ending up with a, a, a less than that uh, reduction because of effort shifts and other things. Your answer before Doug notwithstanding, Commissioner Cross, I'm just, I know what I would do. And so um, 
I guess there is no way. You, you've already said there's not a way to look at a, a quota. What I'm thinking about is whether there's a way to, if the response in the fishery is overwhelming and actually you end up with much higher landings, when precisely would you have, you, you don't have week to week knowledge about that, so you can't effectively manage a quota. Is that right? And so therefore, we couldn't say, put an and to this that would say, unless um, numbers are of this amount are exceeded, giving the uh, director authority to issue a proclamation. I know, I know you, you close it then and you, anyway. Right, so I, I think relative to the option for a quota, that could be on the table in an amendment. Uh, but what we were speaking to earlier is that for a supplement, that wouldn't be something that we could, that we could, we could do. I know I'm just looking into my crystal ball and guessing that the numbers might, well, unless something not unrelated to the fishery either happens or continues so that the abundance is higher, which it could easily be. You know, we could be seeing a, a non-fishery uh, increase in the fishery, and if that's happening, then we could very, very early, very quickly get much higher numbers with before the season is shut. So, so just, trip, trip you, don't, you don't have any, what I'm asking is whether there's any mechanism to have a response to unexpectedly much higher landings. Trip ticket data is due uh, the tenth, by the 10th of the month um, for the following month. So considering that this is so a very short, is, short window, no. pretty much. Okay, thanks. Thank you for not allowing me to just spin around on that one. <laughs> Can I make a quick statement? Um, one thing, just in terms of timelines. So if this were implemented, you would have, uh, we expect that you would have just a single season where this would occur. That season would occur as you're developing Amendment 2. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't impact this supplement, but you may get some idea of how effective it was as you are developing Amendment 2. Not any specific data, but just in terms of a general idea. Okay, Commissioner Bland. Yeah, just some comments um, from Mr. Rader's comment. This, 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 any of these options to close mullets is would be is going to be extraordinary for the fishery. And, and keep in mind your action yesterday to keep a good portion of two river systems closed to any access. So you, right now, what we've essentially looking at doing is twofold here by, by actions in, that we take taking in another FMP. Um, any environmental factors that, that will create like a hurricane, like any hurricane situation, any run, anything that, that, that would hinder a pristine mullet season could indeed happen. So there's a lot of factors here, but I think this, just, just doing this and this alone is going to be a, a, a big deal to the mullet fishery because there has never ever been anything that said you could not go mullet fishing 365 days a year. And so I, while I understand effort does shift and increase and you're gonna see guys and, 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 I, and I can't say that this is going to happen or not, but, but we, the trend on, on anything is that, you know, if you set a date, a guy might try to make two more trips than he normally would that year or three or however many because, he, you know, he's going to push past being tired enough to just go back in the boat and try one more time, and, and that might happen. But there's going to come a firm date, and after that date, any mullets that are left in the fishery, they're going to they're gonna escape. And so I, I think this is a, a definitely a strong and steadfast way of, of, of trying to um, allow some escapement. Um, and, and, and from year to year, these mullets are, are going to show up at different times, and they could very well show up after these dates in, in abundance. Um, because I think you, if you were to go back and tease the data out year to year, you would see that, that, that the catch did shift some either earlier or later. And so uh, not that I'm, I'm a complete advocate for, for doing anything right this second. Um, I do feel like it is a strong option. I, I, I truly do um, to just 
just just put a hard fast date, and that's the last date we're gonna fish during this calendar year. And um, you know, I, I I think with Amendment Two coming right behind, we will have options to put some some. What you want to look at, from what I'm hearing, is some sort of cap or whatever, um, and and so I don't feel like you know it's it's needs to be debated to that level to where we don't feel like it's going to gain us anything if we don't do this in addition. So just keep in mind what, what action was taken yesterday and then taking this action here today, which would take, you know, just a little less than 60 days out of the fishery. I mean, I think that's a pretty big deal. May I respond, Mr. Chair? Uh, hold on one, one second. Let me just clear up something really quick. Director, is it the intention of you and the staff to implement this for just a year? So that's not a, a guarantee, but if the amendment goes as scheduled and we don't run into any hiccups, uh, that would be what we would be looking at because we would hopefully have the amendment um, ready for uh, adoption and implementation before the second year okay. of this. Thank you. Commissioner Rader. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That actually anticipated my response to Mr. Commissioner Blanton, which is my view is that these phenomena naturally will be moving later into the season. And so truth, truthfully, these dates are likely to have a bigger impact than a, a, a lesser impact year to year. And you're right, nobody knows next year, but it could be, it could well be that the schooling up process happens later. But the, uh, anecdotally, last time I tried to predict one of these, which is a stupid thing for a biologist to do, I was looking at whale sharks on the south coast of Cuba. I got it wrong by two weeks, and we had $30,000 on the table for taking people there to see them, and they weren't there. So I, I, anyway, I know how, how dumb that is. But I, I understand, and uh, doing something is, is important. Um, yeah, I don't need this anymore. Commissioner Rollard and Commissioner Krauss. Um, yeah, I mean, um, Commissioner Blanton brought up some really good points, right? And I think that I, I try to, as well as Commissioner Rader, um, this is a hard fishery to understand, right? And it's hard for me to understand. I'm, I'm around it all the time. I don't think, you know, when it comes to worrying about when effort is, you know, we have the temperature issue, but we also have just, you could have one big weather front and you can see an incredible amount of effort. And I think a lot of what Commissioner Blanton brought up are stuff that we're going to have to discuss in the amendment, because this is going to be a really difficult fishery to manage. You know, for my friends who participate in it, you know, we can't have a trip limit, right? Because, you know, people may fish five days for that one really good payday. In addition to that, one of the things we're going to have a lot of trouble with is we can't manage participation in this fishery. And I'm, it's incredible to me how many people just dabble in this fishery, how many neighbors I have that go out on a nice Saturday when it's blowing out of the north. So I think those are going to be issues that we're going to face. Now, um, I will support this because we need to do something to rebuild this fishery. And looking in the past, I mean, virtually this is unregulated. We really, really don't do anything in this fishery. Um, you know, I am concerned about the closure of recreational bait possession only because, I mean, I heard from a lot of people on this, so I felt that I had to bring that up, right? Um, because I don't think we're getting much of a biological benefit from it, and this is one of these other things. The inequitability of this is we can't manage striped mullet, so we're gonna take away white mullet as well from the recreational sector. And I just wanna state that on the record. Um, but I do fully support trying to do something to rebuild this fishery, particularly as a fisherman as an advocate in the fisheries world, I've followed this very closely for over a decade, and I'm surprised we haven't been to this point before, and I'm glad that we have a good stock assessment now. I'll stop rambling. Commissioner Cross. Director, in the just off, out of the left field chance that we have a November hurricane, is there any adaptive management leeway in that to adjust this window at all? I'm just, I'm just I mean, it's a far-fetched possibility, but we've seen crazier things before. 
So I'm just it's not in the draft supplement. I don't necessarily know that we couldn't put it in there, but it's not in there. And any changes with the, for that would take a supermajority. Well, then might I suggest in the future we look at that when we're doing something like this. Okay, any other Well, just so I understand that, Mr. Commissioner Cross, so what you're saying is if there's a late October hurricane that would hit the open season, is if whether there was a mechanism to take it to use. Just response, let's say you, yeah, you get a hurricane the second or third week in October and you've taken two or three weeks of fishing out, then it calms back down and the fish are there, but you've taken out that wind and you couldn't do it. So. Yeah, great. I, thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. To, uh, director. Mr. Chairman, I just want to clarify one thing uh, I said a while ago. I should probably do this with most everything I say, but I, I wanted to clarify that I said that our intent was for this to be one season, but I want to make sure that everybody understands that this supplement, if it passes, will stay in place until the amendment uh, is passed, right? Is that... Okay, I just want to make sure we were clear on that. Okay, um, before we take a vote, let me kind of put this all in a little bit more of a framework. Uh, to pass that, uh, put it back, somebody, what now? It's going to, okay. To, um, let me get, get my thoughts right. To vote this down would not take a supermajority because there's one more option on the table, which would be choice number one. This is choice number two. So when we vote on choice number one, it would take a supermajority to vote it down. That's why I make the big bucks. So. Can, can you repeat, point of clarification, yeah. can you repeat that one more okay. time? Okay, I'll try to. Yeah. If it, it would not take a supermajority to fail this motion. But then, because we have one other option on the table, so we would have to take up that option. For that option to fail, it would take a supermajority. Point of clarification, can you explain the rationale behind that? Because I just, I don't see, we either accept or deny with whatever option. We have... Staff has presented us with two options, either option uh, number one or number two. We are considering number two right now. We still number one is on the table. If number two fails, if number two fails, we have to go to consider number one. For that one to fail, that would take a supermajority because we're throwing all the supplement out. We're kind of throwing one recommendation out right now. So, if it's germane, please make it brief. I was just saying I thought I could simplify this a little bit. <laughs> I'm just speaking off the cuff here. I mean, if someone were to offer option, offer a, uh, a substitute for option one, then this commission would have to consider both of them at the same time, correct? Mm -hmm. well, well, no, I mean, you could, you got with vote one and you vote second. Just well, you... you you consider this, and if we don't like this, we have to consider the other, and the other just takes more votes to. I just turn was down. saying it's you know if we're going to consider it, it may be more palatable to consider the more severe one first. Well, we have a motion on the floor that's been duly seconded. So, can I offer substitute? Yes, you may. I offer substitute um, that we approve supplement A to uh, the amendment, uh, choosing option one. Okay. Microphone. Uh, same motion as previous, just with option one instead. So this will just take a supermajority, just take a regular majority. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, is that your motion as you have made it? That is my motion now I have made it. Thank is you, Is there a second to this? I'll second that. Second, Commissioner McNeil. Discussion. Point of clarification. It's a, yes. Is this going to take a supermajority? No. Okay. All right. If there's no other discussion, go ahead. I, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Um, go right ahead. You know, 
Can, can we pull up the commercial landings with the graph when the two dotted lines in between? Just like for the members to take one, one last look at this. So when I look at this graph, um, when I look at this graph, I see a story. And a lot of people don't read the same story because they don't really understand what went into that graph and, and the effort it took to create that graph in real life. Well, if you look at the time series, it goes from 72 to 21, 2021. That's 40, 50 years. From the 80, 1980, it was in a low like it is now. Effort was tremendous back then. There was 30-some thousand or more commercial fishermen prior to 1994. So as we move along the time series, you see a story being told of lots and lots of participation, lots and lots of landings. And as you progress beyond 1994, you see the Fisheries Reform Act start to take place. Participation starts going down. We start getting landfall and hurricanes in 2016, 2018. 2016 was Matthew, 2018 was Florence. This is what the story is being told by this graph. But as I look at this, I see the trend of landings being fairly stable especially from the t around 2000 on, it's, it's stable. They just kind of hang right in there. And so as you get to 2014, 2015, you see them start to decline a little bit, but, but, but so does the commercial membership and participation in the state. And you get to 21 and you see a big, you know, blip in, in, in uh, effort. And that's because we took flounder away. There's things that happen along this time series that you must understand. And, and to, to try to blatantly take as much as away from people as you possibly can at one time just isn't right. And with option one, you're taking another eight or nine or ten days away from these people when we've just got done talking about the variability, the unpredictability of hurricanes, the variability of how these fish school, and those, those eight or nine or ten days could be extremely important. Mr. Mr. Roller just said that. The five days that somebody would need to make a good check out of this fishery could fall within that extra window of time. So to err on the side of caution is fine. But, put, but to ex put it to the most extreme that we have to do it, I don't feel like that's like absolutely necessary because we're doing a lot. And we're, we did a lot yesterday. We pretty much told these guys they couldn't go up these rivers and fish for these mullets in the fashion that they normally do. Now, they can go up there and throw a cast net or whatever they do, but I, I can guarantee you right now as a commercial member of, of, or commercial fisherman in the state, I'm not going up there throwing a bunch of cast nets. It's not worth my time. And I can, I can speak for a lot of other commercial fishermen too. They're not gonna do it. It's not worth their time. So I can't, I can't support option one. And if I must be supportive of the supplement, I'm gonna support option two because it's middle of the road. It's doing something. And it's allowing a little buffer for environmental factors and the things that, that need to be considered while considering the supplement. 
But to, com- to go and, and cut these nine or t- ten days out just isn't necessary. And that's why I can't support this motion. Commissioner Roller. Thank you, Chair. I will not be amiss to say that I agree with much of what Commissioner Blanton has said. Um, I am supportive of both option one and two. I was just concerned that we may get stuck with option one because I agree with you. I think those few days are a big difference in these fall and seasonality fisheries. But one reason I think that option two may be even better is given the projections that this fishery could rebound pretty quickly if we put some management in place, correct? So um, I just offer that for the commission to consider. Commissioner Ryder. Yeah, I agree with that, uh, Commissioner Roller. And in fact, I was getting ready to make that exact point. In my view, this is more about escapement than any, during the road mullet fishery than anything else. And frankly, if we accounted for the de facto reduction in early season harvest that is likely to come out of the Tarpamico and Noose in this plan, then we probably would, would have a higher reduction than, than shown. So I am going to support option two, which means I'll vote against the current motion. No, nothing personal. No, nothing personal is taken around here, I hope. Okay, if there's not any further discussion, would you bring the motion back up, please? And Laura, do the roll call. Would you like me to read the motion before the vote? Uh, yeah, yes. Okay. Um, so uh, the motion on the floor is substitute motion by Tom Roller to approve Supplement A to Amendment 1 of the Stripe Mullet Fishery Management Plan with Option 1. That's the 33% reduction. Okay. Okay. Roll call. Commissioner Cross? Nay. Commissioner Blanton? No. Commissioner Huggins? No. Commissioner Gardner? Nay. Commissioner McNeil? Nay. Commissioner Rader? Nay. Commissioner Roller? Aye. Commissioner Shellam? Nay. Chairman Bizzle? Nay. Thank you. Motion fails one eight to one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you could abstain. <laughs> okay. Let, let's go back to the initial motion that has been duly seconded. I'm sure there's not any more discussion to be had on that. So we will go straight to a roll call vote. All right. Commissioner Cross? Aye. Commissioner Blanton? Uh, Commissioner Huggins? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Gardner? Aye. Commissioner McNeil? Aye. Commissioner Rader? Aye. Commissioner Roller? Yes. Commissioner Shellam? Aye. Chairman Bizzle? Aye. Motion passes you now. Thanks, staff, director, everybody. We had some good conversation with this. Okay, we're going to move on to Amendment 2 of the Stripe Mullet FMP, the draft, to look at the goals and objectives. I'm just going to push on. I don't think, does anybody really want to have a break? You want five minutes? Okay, well, five minute break, and I mean five. I'm timing everybody.
Okay, we're back. Take it away, gentlemen. I will. Okay, we're back to discuss um, uh, Amendment 2, the Stripe FMP, Stripe Mill FMP draft, and vote on our approval of our goals and objectives. So let's do it. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss Amendment 2 to the North Carolina Stripe Mullet FMP. I know it's only been five minutes, but <laughs> just to reintroduce ourselves, this is, as Dan mentioned, <laughs> The reason for my I'm Jeff actions. Dobbs, the co-lead for the Stripe Mullet FMP, and next to me is Daniel Zaff, the other co-lead. Okay, to begin, I'd like to take a minute to review some background material, beginning with the original FMP. The fishery management plan was adopted in April 2006. It established minimum and maximum commercial landings triggers of 1.3 and 3.1 million pounds. The triggers were based off of average commercial landings during the range of years used in the stock assessment. If a trigger was hit, the division would reevaluate the data to determine what was driving the change, it established a daily possession limit of 200 mullets, white and striped combined per person per day in the recreational fishery. Amendment 1 resolved issues with Newport gillnet attendance and mitigated known user group conflicts. It also updated the minimum and maximum commercial landing triggers to 1.13 and 2.76 million pounds. Moving on to the current FMP cycle, the commission was presented with the results of the peer-reviewed 2022 stock assessment at their May meeting. Stan went over before the results of the 2022 striped mullet benchmark stock assessment indicated the North Carolina striped mullet stock is overfished and overfishing is occurring in the terminal year of the assessment, 2019. Management actions in Amendment 2 will focus on ending overfishing and rebuilding the spawning stock biomass to provide sustainable harvest. On the two figures at the bottom, you'll see horizontal solid and dashed black lines. On both figures, the solid lines represent the threshold and the dashed lines represent the target. The figure on the left shows fishing mortality calculated by the model. It's our fishing mortality graph here. Uh, the threshold is the highest fishing mortality the stock can handle while still being sustainable. The target is where we want fishing mortality to be to provide the most benefit to the stock and the fishery. Fishing mortality in 2019 is above the threshold indicating overfishing is occurring. The catch rate is too high. The stock has been experiencing overfishing since 2012 and fishing mortality has been above the target since 2000. The figure on the right shows spawning stock biomass. So these are the same figures that Dan presented. So we have mortality on the left and spawning stock biomass on the right. <clears throat> um, so spawning stock biomass is the amount of mature females in the population. The threshold is the lowest biomass the stock can maintain and still be sustainable. If biomass is under this line, the stock is overfished. The target is where we want biomass to be to provide the most benefit. The spawning stock biomass is below the threshold in 2019, indicating the stock is overfished. There are not enough mature females in the population to maintain the stock. The stock has been overfished since 2002 and below the target since 1991. As Corinne discussed during the FMP presentation, we are in the second step of the FMP process today with Stripe Mullet. With the information you provide us today and the public input through the scoping in mind, we will begin developing Amendment 2. The PDT will have FMP advisory committee workshops to, to further develop the plan in 2023. Um, I'm going to speak to the scoping period now. The scoping process serves to provide notice to the public that a formal review of the FMP is underway by the division, inform the public of the stock status of the species, if available, 
solicit public input on the list of potential management strategies identified by the division or identify other relevant strategies for consideration and to recruit potential advisors to serve on the FMPAC. I'm gonna give you a short review of the outcomes of our three scoping meetings. So stripe mullet scoping period was for amendment two occurred from September 26th through October 7th, 2022. The division held three meetings in Manio, Moorhead City, and Wilmington, where more than 60 people attended in person or virtually. Additionally, 153 people provided comment through online responses to the scoping questionnaire and comments centered around concern over the stock assessment, including the results in the terminal year being 2019. Stakeholders at all three meetings reiterated the need for regional management. They stressed that the seasonality market and fishing methods vary significantly across the state. The public gave support for gear-specific management through either minimum or maximum gill net mesh sizes to reduce bycatch or exclude large females from the gear. Stakeholders at the meeting and through questionnaire responses expressed the need for year-round fishing. Many commercial fishermen rely on striped mullet for most of the year. They commented that depending on region, the bait and meat market can be just as valuable, if not more so than the row market. The public repeatedly expressed support for adaptive management. The division heard that from commercial fishermen's experience, once regulations are put in, they don't go away. They would like to build a mechanism into the plan where if the stock improves, regulations could be eased. They also made it very clear that the metric used to assess stock health should not be based on landings. The public also expressed recreational harvest concerns. The division heard comments that folks were uneasy about the accuracy of the MRIP estimates, worries about the high number of finger mullet harvested, and user conflicts associated with recreational cast netting. Um, your action item today is to approve the draft goals and objectives. The goal is to manage the striped mullet fishery to achieve a self-sustaining population that provides sustainable harvest using science-based decision-making processes. And the objectives to achieve this goal are to implement management strategies within North Carolina that sustain and or restore the striped mullet spawning stock with adequate age structure abundance to maintain recruitment <coughs> potential and prevent overfishing. To promote the restoration, enhancement, and protection of critical habitat and environmental quality in a manner consistent with the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan to maintain or increase growth, survival, and reproduction of the striped mullet stock. To use biological, social, economic, fishery, habitat, and environmental data to effectively monitor and manage the fishery and its ecosystem impacts. And finally, to advance stewardship of the North Carolina striped mullet stock by promoting practices that minimize bycatch and discard mortality. So I'm gonna go over just some input from uh, the division on potential management strategies. The division has identified five potential management strategies for stripe mullet FMP amendment two. The first is sustainable harvest. This is where the bulk of quantifiable measures will come from. The strategies to attain sustainable harvest could include quota management, fishing seasons, trip limits, size limits, fishing days, and or gear modifications. Uh, the next major uh, potential management option would be uh, reductions from the commercial fishery. Um, they're difficult to quantify due to li data limitations. To address this, the division hopes to better characterize the fishery within, within recreational fisheries management strategies could include measures that support sustainable harvest, non-quantifiable management measures, and addressing the use of mullet as cut bait in the mutilated fin fish rule. Moving on to the small mesh gill net issue, the MFC passed a motion to not initiate rulemaking on small mesh gill nets, but refer the issue through the FMP process for each species. Small mesh gill net issues include regulatory complexity, bycatch reduction, and user conflict. Restric restrictions on small mesh gill nets could help to support sustainable harvest. Moving on to stop nets. The stop net fishery is a historically important fishery that has had issues with bycatch and user conflicts. The amendment presents an opportunity to address the effectiveness of current management and investigate new management to support sustainable harvest. 
Finally, the designation of seasonal or permanent migration corridors where harvest of striped mullet or certain fishing gears are not allowed could be used to provide additional protection to the stock. I just wanted to reiterate that these are just some ideas that the division has identified for management strategies. This is by no means a comprehensive list and we are open to any suggestions you may have today. Um, moving forward, the next steps are the division will develop a first draft of Amendment 2. That process will take place now through May 2023. The division PDT will work with the FMPAC at workshops to develop a second draft of Amendment 2 in June 2023. The draft Amendment 2 will be brought back to the MFC for approval to go for public and AC review at the August 2023 meeting. So action items today would be to vote on the approval of Amendment 2 goals and objectives and to receive input from the Marine Fisheries Commission um, on potential management strategies for Amendment 2. Okay, Commissioner Roller. This is kind of a, just kind of an academic thought here based on my observations on this fishery. I, I know a lot of mullet fishermen, right? And I know some who are really professional fishermen and I know a bunch who have half a million dollar plus homes and call themselves a mullet fisherman and they go a few Saturdays of fall. Um, I would be interested in hearing from the commission as well as some ideas. And I mean, we can't manage participation, right? We're not allowed to legally. We can't do limited entry or whatnot. And I'm not suggesting that. I'm just, I'm interested in things that we can do to protect the actual fishermen in this fishery, right? And not and, and and try to source through some of that. Just, just I'm looking around there. I just want to make sure people understood what I'm saying. I mean, maybe no fishing on Saturdays. I don't know. Just throwing that out there. Okay. All right. Any other comments on the management options? Management. Yeah. Yes, Commissioner Rader. I do, and this is general and unformed right now, but I'm just fair warning that I'm going to bring these two issues up repeatedly during our time together. The first has to do with translating the great language that I agree with completely here that we'll be approving and I'll be voting for into the reference points that then manifest in the plan and in the, in the models. And I, I'm getting increasingly uncomfortable with any SPR measure below 30%, even for threshold um, targeting. And the reason is that all of that is based on historical conditions that don't exist today in many cases and are less and less likely to exist in the future, both in terms of individual species biology and also the interactions among species and the habitats that they depend upon. And so I think and, and that, that includes climate signals, but also other changes like that. So I, I get. I think the riskiness of choosing measures like that is going up through time as uncertainty variability increases and uncertainty increases. And so I'm going to I'm going to say that <laughs> again and again. And I'll just note that we we have one of those here. Not that I'm advocating anything particular, but if we just pay some attention to the stability and effectiveness of th uh, reference points being chosen through this amendment in terms of climate and other changing environmental and social signals, I would appreciate it. Okay. Any other comments? Commissioner Blanton. So is today the last day or the last chance we have to offer management option input or is there going to be one other time that we would? So after we go to uh, to develop the FMP, the draft with the uh, FMP AC, we will bring that back to you. Um, but this would be your best time to provide that input because we haven't even started the process of writing the management plan. So we could better include your, your recommendations at this point early in the process as to when we're finished. Okay. If, if I may. I just want to clarify. So in terms of the overall process, if you have something that you want to be thoroughly vetted as we go through, this is a good time to make that uh, known. And in terms of management options, there are other opportunities. But this is the point where staff are going to sit down 
and take a hard look at many of these issues and start to flesh out those issue papers. So if there's a bigger issue, this is a good moment to give us that information so it can really get vetted along with all the other issues. Just to follow up. Sure. So this is the point in, the, in building an FMP that I, I think should be made very clear to the members of this commission to where um, we have a lot of new members. This was their one of their first, very, very first meeting. And so um, I think in the past, this is where we have gotten it a little wrong and where I have noticed trends of you build your draft, you bring it back, we read it. There's people that members that are not unsatisfied that there are not additional options that are that they had ideas about. And so, um, you know, then we get into this backtracking and, 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 and the director shaking her head that, that but she un understands, I think the chair has seen this as well and, and the council. And so th there gets to be this great big debate on, um, you know, well, I want it to be this way. I want it to be that way because this option, that option, and the division has to carry this back. And these are just some comments that I'm offering right now. And I'm wondering if there is um, a chance that we can uh, digest this a little longer, come back, and to you know, if you're going to take up mullet at the next meeting and say, "Listen, any hard, fast things you want us to look at, you need to have it to us by this meeting," um, and that's my question. So Correct. I've got something, and Laura, Laura might have something in addition. But I, I totally agree with um, Commissioner Blanton, and we have talked about this internally, where we are trying to address this because my point to the staff was early on: we come to this commission with goals and objectives. And then they see us two years later with a with a draft, and then they start discussion man, discussing management. And so we recognize uh, the implications of that. That's why we have tried to add to the agenda. Once we start with an FMP, every meeting we provide a verbal update about where we are, whether we are meeting with the FMP advisory committees or wherever we are in the process. We come back to the table and talk about that now. The strategies or the bigger approaches, and the earlier that we can get them, the better. Uh, we, we saw with Flounder, we got some really good or what we thought might be good potential things to discuss and develop, but we got them so late in the process, it, it was hard to, to, to deal with. So I think there's some give and take there about how we can incorporate the strategies. And to your point, just seeing this, hearing this for the first time for the commissioners around the table that aren't familiar with mullet, is how do you know what input you want to give in this juncture? So we will be back to talk about this. Uh, and I think as we go through this process, we can, we can add things to develop. We all just have to be conscious of how that impacts the process. That's really all, all we have to be conscious of because we don't want to just fly through it and not have the things, the strategies that we really want to evaluate and that need to be evaluated just because it's, hindering the timeline. So we, we, we just have to be to work together on that. So. Yeah. The onus is on us. It's up to us to become educated on the issues. And if we're not educated on what's going on in this case with Stripe Mullet, it's our own fault. And But we need to take the time to know about the issues involved with the management of it and knowing that there's going to come a day that we're going to have to make a vote. And you better make an informed vote and inform comments along the way. So it's on us, and you've got materials in front of you, uh, staff that will more than welcome your questions and comments. Just one follow-up to that. I, I think what I, what, and the director understood, I think, but um, what I would like to see avoided more so than anything with this FMP is the get down the road and then hold on, wait a minute, these op I like these options and they're not in there. And so what I'm asking the director, um, or more so than anything, is there a hard, fast time that, that you can, that you can uh, advise us on to say, listen, if you, if you have any management options that you would, or strategies or anything that you would like to see incorporated in this amendment, um, when would you like to um, have that in by so that we avoid any 
down the road issues of so so obviously now is a good time if you have some and the other times that I think are going to be important especially when we start to meet with the FMP advisory committee and those meetings are where we approach those folks and say what strategies you know here's the strategies that we've identified do y'all have any and then we start to build the FMP from that point so when we start coming back to this commission like the first time we meet with those and those folks and we discuss strategies and we come back to this commission then if you have a strategy that they haven't discussed or you haven't already identified then we would want to put it in there at least by then because you know then we can start to develop develop the strategy through the development of the fishery management plan and i will also uh, encourage the commissioners when we start meeting with the advisory committees uh, the FMP advisory committee on these specific FMPs is a great opportunity to go and hear uh, the things that those folks who are involved with the fishery uh, have and the thoughts that they have. Because sometimes, I mean, for us, you know, we learn a lot from that interaction. It's a workshop type format, which we've changed up. It's a lot of back and forth discussion, just general conversations about the fisheries and how people think they need to be managed or how they want to see them managed. And I think that is a very pivotal point of FMP development. And it's where we kind of try to really nail down these things that need to go into FMP. Absolutely. The workshop format, why it takes more intense time over a shorter period of time, it is, a, it is very effective and where you don't have to go back and reinvent the wheel at each meeting. Commissioner Rader. I said it before in the last discussion, but I should say it again to now, and that is that I, I think we would be remiss to not consider preferential escapement of older females and, this, and me potential mechanisms that achieves that end. And then the second comment is that uh, Commissioner Shellam and I have already decided to um, take the same proactive strategy with respect to the habitat issues related here and so rather than use the Habitat and Water Quality Standing Advisory Committee, which we chair and co-chair, as a sounding board after the fact to begin in January looking at asking the members questions about habitat and water quality priorities related to this on the front end of FMP development. And so we'll be doing that uh, all along. Okay. Commissioner Cross. One of the items that I think you all should look at on, on this amendment if it becomes necessary in the future after the supplement to close an area, close the season, whatever, I think you should put adaptive measures in there to look at the different regions because these fish are migrating from north to south pretty predominantly. And it's not right to throw all the closure time on one particular region, no matter which one it is. So if that, if that was to ever become a factor in the future, I think you need to look at having that uh, option basically in place to enact in the plan accordingly. Okay. All right. We need to vote on the goals and objectives as, excuse me, Sarah. Speak in your microphone if you would, please. Um, in, pull up, in, pull up in, close to you if you would. <laughs> I was you. wondering if also looking at possible, in order to extend those prime months like October and November, um, could could a daily closure be a potential management use? Like you can fish this fishery Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. Would that would allow for maximum, like the best row fish coming through, having being able to target that those fish, and also allowing a lot of escapement, but still giving. Uh, fishermen some weather window days would that okay that's something that could be considered Commissioner Cross no sir uh, as you're being a guide that would put a lot of emphasis on weather and days you can and can't fish and if you got three or four days and then all of a sudden you can't fish these two days because they're closed down so that's a that's a slippery slope when you start looking at that. That's the only reason I'm saying that is because it's more weather driven than anything. Okay. Good discussions. Okay. Commissioner Roller, one last thing. I, I just want to, you know, kind of follow up with what Commissioner Gardner 
and Commissioner Cross says, I, I agree with that. I mean, it's going to be really hard to like source through weather in this. And that goes back to my previous comments of, I mean, I, I don't even know if it'd be possible. I'd love to see an analysis of participation so we could kind of source out, you know, who's who, who this fishery is most important to, right? Because it's there's a lot of participants, and I see a lot of participants who aren't very serious in it, which is a concern to me, right? Um, and I just don't know if we can approach that. But I, I do understand where, where you're coming from there. But um, I just want to offer one more thing, kind of goes back to Commissioner Rader's comments. You know, you know, this is an important forage fish, and, you know, we're seeing massive climate impacts on all our fisheries. So when we're dealing with climate and fisheries, it's, there's nothing we can really do about it other than be more conservation-based. And I think that that's something that we really need to always consider. Okay. All right. Can y'all pull up the goals and objectives screen again? Okay. These are the goals and objectives for the um, uh, Sprite Muller FMP, and we need to address these. Can I have a motion that we accept these? Motion to accept goals and objectives. All right. Is there a second? Second. Second. Commissioner Rader. All right. All um, right. Let's get that up there, and then we'll do a roll call. All right. Commissioner Cross? Aye. Commissioner Blanton? Aye. Commissioner Gardner? Aye. Commissioner Huggins? Aye. Commissioner McNeil? Aye. Commissioner Rader? Aye. Commissioner Roller? Aye. Commissioner Shellum? Aye. And Chairman Bizzle? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you for y'all's work. Thank y'all for the, the um, conversations. Okay, moving on to rulemaking. Rule suspension. Uh, excuse me, what, what, what? Okay. I just wanted to put a plug in where if anyone between now and the next meeting has any ideas or comments or anything, Dan and I are always open for phone calls, emails. You can contact Steve or anyone, but we'd love to hear from you and continue this conversation about management strategies. If you have any input, we'd love to hear it. Sounds great. Thank you for that opportunity. Okay, Steve, rule suspension. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Steve Poland, Fishery Management Section Chief, and today I'm going to briefly review the rule suspension memo that's located in your briefing materials and ask that you consider a new temporary rule suspension for Marine Fishery Commission Rule 03R0117. So in accordance with uh, DMF management policy and Marine Fisheries Commission Rule and general statutes, the director may suspend in whole or in part any Marine Fishery Commission Rule that may be affected by variable conditions until the next meeting of the commission, at which time the Marine Fisheries Commission may vote to delegate to the director the authority to continue to suspend the rule the Marine Fisheries Commission may vote to suspend the rule indefinitely for a fixed period of time or until external conditions change or established triggers occur. So following a vote by the Marine Fisheries Commission to suspend the rule, the division will update the Marine Fisheries Commission at each meeting with a memo detailing the current list of suspended rules and verbally review the list of suspended rules annually at every November meeting of the MFC. So we're here at the November meeting. So. I have to read through this entire list of suspended rules, and I'll do that as fast as my Southern Nash County accent will allow me. All right, first rule is O3M0515, Section A2, Dolphin. Uh, suspension of a portion of this rule is, allows the division to adjust the recreational vessel limit to complement management of dolphin under the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council's Amendment 10 to the Dolphin Fishery Management Plan. And that rule is suspended indefinitely. Next, we have O3L 0105, um, Section 2. Suspension of a portion of this rule is for an indefinite period of time and allows the division to modify the recreational possession limit of shrimp by removing the four quarts heads on and two and a half quarts heads off prohibition from waters close to shrimping. And this is in accordance with Amendment 2 to the Shrimp Fishery Management Plan that y'all approved uh, last November. Next is O3J 0103, Section H. Um, suspension of a portion of this rule for an indefinite period allows the division to implement year-round small mesh gillnet attendance requirements in certain areas of the Tarpam and Noose River systems. And this action was taken as part of a department initiative to review existing small mesh gillnet rules um, to limit yardage and address attendance requirements in certain areas of the state. 
Next, we have 03R110, sections 4 and 5. And this rule is suspended indefinitely, and it allows the division to revise the boundaries for the Drum Inlet and Barden Inlet crab spawning sanctuaries in accordance with Amendment 3 to the uh, Blue Crab Fishery Management Plan. Next, we've got uh, three rules, 03L, 0201, Sections A and B, 03L, 0203, Section A, and 03J, 0301, Sections A1, G, and H. Uh, suspension of portions of these three rules is for an indefinite period, and it allows the division to implement requirements for the blue crab fishery in accordance with Amendment 3 to the blue crab fishery management plan. Next, we have 03L, 0103, Sections A1. Um, this rule is suspended indefinitely, and it allows the division to adjust um, trawl net minimum mesh size requirements in accordance with Amendment 2 to the shrimp fishery management plan. Next, we have 03J0501, Section E2. This is suspended for an indefinite period and allows the division to increase the minimum mesh size of escape panels for flounder pound nets in accordance with um, Southern Flounder Fishery Management Plan Amendment 2. And last, we have two rules, 03M0519, Section A and B, and 03Q0107, Section 4. Um, these portions of these rules are suspended for an indefinite period and allows the division to change the season and creel limits for American Shad under the management framework for the North Carolina American Shad Sustainable Fishery Management Plan. <clears throat> so for you today, there is one rule suspension for you all to consider. The director has suspended a portion of Rule 03R0117 titled Oyster Sanctuaries. Specifically, the director suspended sub items C, I, and J of item one of um, the rule. The suspension was needed to issue proclamation FF6 2022, which provides the correct and current boundary coordinates as well as harvest restrictions for the Pea Island, Raccoon Island, and Swan Island oyster sanctuaries. This rule was recently modified and adopted by the Marine Fisheries Commission but upon publication, staff determined that the coordinates uh, in that rule um, were published incorrectly for the Pea Island and Raccoon Island sanctuaries. And additionally, the Swan Island sanctuary boundaries um, expanded since the publication of that rule and no longer consistent with the published coordinates. So staff are working on drafting a rule issue paper to modify the rule with the current coordinates. But an interest is ensuring that the sanctuaries continue to be protected according to the fishery management plan. The director suspended the portion of the rule that incorrectly delineated the boundaries and issued the previously mentioned proclamation to temporarily collect uh, or correct the discrepancy. And I just want to note, I believe that draft issue paper is slated to come back to you at your May um, commission meeting. So the division recommends that MSC consider voting suspend the aforementioned portions of 03R0117 indefinitely to allow the division time to draft the rule issue paper to correctly delineate the three orchard sanctuary described earlier. And I have provided um, motion language on the screen for your consideration. Yep, there it is. So I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay, any questions on this? If not, can I have a motion to accept? To, okay, Commissioner Roller. So moved. Is there a second? Is there a second? Commissioner second. Rader? Second. Okay, great. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes without dissension. <clears throat> Thanks, Steve. Catherine, come on up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Catherine Bloom. I'm the division's rulemaking coordinator, for those who don't already know me. And the bad news is I have a rulemaking update for you. But the good news is that means your meeting is drawing to a close. Um, OK, I'll start my remarks with just a little bit of context for the benefit of our newest commissioner and a repeat of what I said at the last meeting, just to bring everybody up to the same start line. So North Carolina General Statute 113-134 
gives the commission broad authority to adopt rules for the management, protection, preservation, and enhancement of the state's marine and estuarine resources. We've just spent three days talking about those things. So uh, additionally, General Statute 150B-21.3A, which is the periodic review and expiration of existing rules, requires that state agencies, any state agency that implements rules, to review those existing rules at least once every 10 years in accordance with a prescribed process. And that includes rule readoption as if the rules are brand new rules. So taken together, satisfying those responsibilities have led this commission to undertake numerous rulemaking actions over the last five years or so. So to do this, the commission has promulgated multiple packages of rules within any given year. And thankfully, we are on the downhill side of successfully completing the periodic review and readoption process for those approximate 375 rules that the commission has. Uh, you will notice that the report that I'm giving provides an update on several different packages and different years, and those are just demarcated uh, within a given year by letters, just to separate them out. So now we have returned to a single rulemaking package per year, at least for a while. Uh, I will say the periodic review round two, the next 10-year block, is on the horizon line. So I'll be telling you more about that as we learn what that's going to uh, look like. So the rulemaking update section of your briefing materials, there's a memo and supporting documents, and uh, that gives you the update that I'm trying to summarize the, the high spots of here verbally. Um, you can certainly follow along with those materials. The rulemaking memo is listed first. However, I will say there are no rulemaking actions for the commission at this meeting. Um, that's unusual. We usually have had something at every meeting. Um, that doesn't mean that what I have to say is not important for the record of your meeting, so I'll try to get through this as quickly as I can. Um, I'm going to start with a quick update on the 2021-2022 cycle, and that included rules from two different packages that I've got to still tell you about. Uh, the first is package B. So package A is all done. I'm not talking about that anymore. Package B is the one I still need to uh, bring you up to speed on. At your August 2021 meeting, so last year, you approved notice of text for rulemaking to begin the process for 109 rules. It was the largest package that uh, we've undertaken. And so you gave final approval for those rules in February of this year, and there were 38 rules that were not automatically subject to legislative review. Those became effective either June 1st or July 1st of this year, and most fishermen saw very little change from those rules. We did issue a news release and, of course, a supplement to your rule book. Um, those were distributed on each of those dates. There are 71 rules that are automatically subject to legislative review, and that's according to a couple different laws. One is Session Law 2019-198, and the other is North Carolina General Statute 14-4.1. So these laws require that any rule that creates a new criminal offense or otherwise subjects a person to criminal penalties is automatically subject to legislative review. So this is about a third of the commission's 375 rules uh, that are impacted by these laws. In general terms, the legislative review process means that unless a bill is specifically filed that uh, disapproves a given rule, then by default, the rule will become effective on the earlier of the 31st legislative day or adjournment of that regular session. And so, in plain terms, <laughs> um, the legislative review, besides the oversight of the legislature, it just it adds time to the rulemaking process. That's kind of the takeaway. Um, so about a third of the commission's rules, it's going to take longer before they're through the whole process. Three of the 71 rules I mentioned that were automatically subject uh, that are from Package B, those covered highly efficient gears, artificial reefs, and research sanctuaries, and those became effective just after your August meeting, August 23rd. Um, and that was that 31st legislative day of the short session this year. Uh, th so there's 68 rules from Package B that are available for legislative review when the 2023 session begins. And I'll continue to keep you updated until those rules are through the process. Uh, so next is Package C. And you actually heard a little something about uh, a portion of these rules at this meeting. Um, at your March 2022 special meeting, you approved notice of text to begin the process for nine joint rules 
that pertain to the classification of the waters of North Carolina as uh, coastal fishing waters, joint fishing waters, and inland fishing waters. And the rules were proposed for readoption with no changes. Um, the Wildlife Resources Commission has 11 joint rules that were substantively identical. And so between April and June of this year, both agencies gave final approval to both sets of rules since they're jointly adopted. And so those became effective September 1st and are all done except <laughs> one of the commissions, our commission's rules, um, is in that batch of automatically subject to legislative review. So that became the 69th rule that we're waiting for in the 2023 long session to have an effective date. Um, and so hopefully that will continue to go through uh, without any uh, delays, but um, I'll keep you updated at your February meeting. It cannot, by the math, it cannot be resolved in time by your February meeting, um, but I'll be able to shorten these updates as things get resolved as we move forward. Okay, so the last of the packages to update you on is the one you just started at your last meeting in August. Um, it's a small package of rules, just two rules, mutilated finfish and marinas, mooring areas, and other docking facilities. And there is a table in your briefing materials if you're following along. It shows the steps in the process, the usual steps in the rulemaking process. So those rules were published October 3rd in the North Carolina Register, and that began the public comment period, which has to be at least 60 days. Uh, we did include an excerpt of the North Carolina Register in your materials so that you have what was published for the public. Uh, we also issued a news release October 3rd, and that's in your materials as well. The original 60-day public comment period was from October 3rd until 5 p.m. December 2nd, and we had one single public hearing scheduled via WebEx on November 1st. And I did want to thank Commissioner McNeil publicly uh, for being available to chair that hearing. However, we had a technical issue and we were not able to complete the hearing. And so we had to reschedule that. And the soonest we could do that is December 16th. That will be held in person only at the Moorhead City Central District Office of the division. Uh, we simply cannot afford any possibility of additional technical problems. So we're gonna hold it in person only like all the hearings used to be um, and get that opportunity out there for the public to provide in-person comments. Um, Commissioner Cross has agreed to chair that hearing for us. Thank you, Commissioner Cross, in advance. I'll be following up with you after this meeting. Um, and so now the public comment period has been extended to 5 p.m. Friday, December 16th. That keeps you on track as scheduled to receive a summary of any public comments that have been received at your February meeting when you're scheduled to vote on final approval of those two rules. The mutilated finfish rule is one of those that's automatically subject, and unfortunately, because the long session will already be underway, that rule must await the 2024 short session before it can be resolved. Um, however, the marina's rule, it, unless there are any changes in the process, would be effective as early as May 1st of 2023. So the last item I have, Mr. Chairman, is a preview of next year's rule cycle that we're already working on. We're preparing those materials. We are working on the last of the readopted rules. Um, we have a group of 79 rules remaining, and those are in subchapter 18A for public health. They all pertain to shellfish plants and inspections. We're preparing those as a group of rules to bring to you at your May meeting to begin the process. Um, and that will allow us to meet the readoption deadline of June 30th, 2024. This commission must give final approval of the rules prior to that date to keep them in the North Carolina Administrative Code. We are preparing additional materials for your consideration, and I'll be bringing you more information at your February meeting. Steve just mentioned one of those issues, which is corrections and additions to the Oyster Sanctuaries rule. And we do have two or three other issues that we're preparing to bring to you. I'll give you that update at your next meeting. So proposed rules in this upcoming cycle that would start in May would have an earliest effective date of April 1st, 2024. Again, except if any of those rules are automatically subject to legislative review. And that would be taken up during that same short session of 2024 along with the mutilated finfish rule. So that's as condensed as I could do it. I promise the updates will get shorter as we finish out these older rule packages. Um, but I'm glad to take any questions. Thank you. You did very well in condensing it. Any questions or comments? Commissioner Bland. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, 
Catherine, you, you, you had the hardest job at the division. I'm very convinced of that. But <laughs> so, did I hear you right about the mutilated? Were you talking about the mutilated finfish rule? Mm -hmm. And could you go back and talk about? You said something about because of the long session, this and that, you wouldn't be able to get anything done with that. Is that did I hear that correctly? You did hear that correctly. So the timing is such that when this commission takes final action, which is expected to be at your February meeting, because the long session of 2023 has already begun, that rule that is automatically subject to legislative review would be forwarded to the General Assembly for review at its next session that has not yet started. That's how the law is written, essentially. So it has to arrive at the legislature a certain number of days before the session has begun. And because of that, it's going to sit in the queue until prior to the start of the short session in 2024. So it will sit waiting for the General Assembly review for over 12 months. Okay, I just and, and that assumes there's no changes at the Rules Review Commission level. That's a step that occurs after this commission votes on it. And, you know, your counsel can certainly give you the, the detailed specifics if you need them from the actual Administrative Procedure Act. But you, you heard me correctly, and it's just a matter of sort of the timing. If it had been an odd year or an even year, that's what dictates that. If we were coming into 2022, then it's possible it would be resolved in time to be taken up during the 2022 short session. When it's the odd year, it's going to take much longer. So that rule will be in a hold for a good year or more before we know. And as you saw from this summer, the short session um, wasn't terribly short. I mean, it, they it, never those were. rules, it was August 23rd before that 31st day of session had occurred because they took a few um, recesses along the way. Yeah. Good pickup, Mike. Sure. I just, I just wanted to get, you know, make sure I heard that update correctly. You know, we worked on that. That was a big rule issue that we took up, um, and it's going to affects a whole lot of users. That's right. So yep. anyway, it's just a little disappointing that it can't move along a little quicker than and it I is. Appreciate and I, I just you bringing wanted to make up. sure I, yep. I heard that correctly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, okay. staff went to uh, the trouble to try to incorporate that piece of information in the issue paper and make plain that it is going to take a while just because of when the issue began. Um, it's just sort of how the, the years fall. But um, we, we tried to include that along the way, and that's why I continue to give that update. But I certainly appreciate you elevating it because it can get lost in all these technical details. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> now, I would absolutely defer to the director. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Not, Catherine, thank you very much. You, we, we're glad you're there. <clears throat> okay, our meeting is starting to wind down a little bit. i uh, like to open up the floor to our commissioners if they have any other issues they want staff to be looking at or addressing. Um, Commissioner Roller. No new issues, don't worry. Two questions. So um, I just want to be sure we will be providing a letter to the South Atlantic Council for the December meeting regarding dolphin management, correct? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, second issue is where are we on the false albacore information paper? I don't have an update right now. Um, okay. I will get one to you, and I'll send it around to the full commission. That would be wonderful. I, I see Steve looking. Yeah, I'll just say staff is uh, currently working on it. I don't know... Um, Laura, when it's on our work schedule, but I think we'd originally thought, you know, probably May. But okay, so it'd be that late before we get that out to so May, May. Potentially, but potential. I mean, when staff pulls the information together and starts to draft it, I mean, we, we can have those conversations internal and see okay. where we're we at. Just, could it. you follow up on that? Yeah. Okay, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. That's all I got. Mission Cross. Several of us have discussed, and we want staff to look at possibly in the future of looking at what the impacts of these fishing tournaments have uh, directed at certain species and possibly putting on the agenda to discuss the prohibition of allowing any tournaments that are specifically directed at uh, any species that is deemed overfish or overfishing is occurring. We'd like to see some numbers of what y'all think are, are occurring in big batches at these tournaments. Okay, anything else from anybody? 
Mr. Rowell, you look confused. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just unusual. curious what tournament you're referring to, what particular species. Uh, I mean, you know, if speckled trout ends up being listed, that's one. So I just want to be more specific. Yeah. So you're concerned about only, only, tournaments for speckled trout? No, I'm only concerned if it's listed as. Okay, but is there anything? I'm just. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, I concur with you, and I agree with the direction in which you're going there. I was just curious what species you were specifically worried about. Used to be, it used to be flounder, but obviously that ain't going to... Yeah, we don't flounder no, tournaments, but, so that's why... I'm, I'm just yeah. saying anything that we would list as such, we just, you know, just to get some discussion out there. Okay, I just... Okay, just curious if you had any specific examples as to tournaments that you were worried about. All right, anything else from anybody? Just want to make an observation. Um... Sometimes uh, working with fishery management gets into your soul and it cannot be exercised out. Um, we had four former commissioners at our public comment session making comment, which I think is great. So um, I, my hat's off to them to not giving up when they left the table, and I was pleased to see them here. Okay, um, yes. Uh, and I'm in the process of um, the f &P developments and whatnot. If it pleases the chair, in the future, you know, when we bring either the final FMP to the table or whatever, I'd love to see the chair of these different committees in person at these meetings available for comment or questions if when we're starting to get down to the nitty-gritty on these final. I mean, I know it may be a little bit more time-consuming to have, but, I mean, that way you'd have a gist of the discussions and whatnot during the committee roundtable discussions and whatnot. Talking about like north, south, fin fish. Well, anybody that we don't already have, like we got some of us here that are yeah. chairs, but anybody else that not. has involvement in it, if they're willing to come, at least we would have an idea of what their discussions were if we asked them if we needed to. Okay, right. just have them in the audience. More That's right. Okay. All right. I think we could look into that. Yes, Commissioner Wright. And just for the record, I wanted the uh, commissioners to recognize that um, a close friend and colleague, Dr. Stan Riggs, received from Governor Cooper the North Carolina Award, the highest citizens award given in North Carolina uh, just a couple of days ago. And he's he's been a stalwart warrior for an entire uh, career at protecting some of the critical habitats that are so important to the fisheries in North Carolina. Yeah. And I was uh, delighted and already gave my personal grat uh, congratulations to him for that. So if you just happen to see him, don't be shy. Yeah. Order Longleaf Pine. Okay, um, Laura, review our work plan and meeting assignments. And before I forget it, everybody's got a name tag here, which I ask staff to provide just when we're out and about and everybody knows who we are. You might want to leave them here because if you're like me, three months from now, you will have no idea where it is. <laughs> so, Laura. We'd be happy to keep track of those. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Chair. Um, so following your discussions on the joint uh, fishing water delineation issue, staff are going to be reaching out to the WRC staff and we'll plan to continue to update the commission on the issue and, of course, discuss it with you. Um, you approve this full slate of nominees for the obligatory seat for the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council and staff will prepare those um, for submittal. So you gave final approval on Amendment 2 of the Estuarine Stripe Bass FMP, and staff will begin implementing um, those selected management options. Um, you approved Option 2 for the Supplement A to the Amendment 1 of the Stripe Mullet FMP, and again, the division will begin to implement um, that approved management. Uh, and following uh, closely on that, the division is also um, going to continue to develop Amendment 2 using the goal and objectives you just approved. Um, your next meeting is scheduled for February 22nd through the 24th um, in New Bern. And I do want to take a minute. I did not, and I should have done this in the beginning. Um, we do have a new program assistant with the Marine Fishery Commission office. Her name is Paula Farnell. And um, I am deeply grateful <laughs> that we now <laughs> have someone else. So your work plan is not updated but it absolutely will be at the next meeting. So thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Happy holidays to everybody. Be safe. Be good. See you all in February. Meetings adjourned.